Hello, everybody. It's Vic with Cardiac Wire, and today we're going to be talking to Dr. Gregory Means about his experience with AI STEMI solution. So with that, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Dr. Means? Thanks, Victor. So I'm Greg Means. I'm an interventional cardiologist in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'm from North Carolina originally and, um, you know, really got a passion for, for medicine and, and seeing some of my patients who had to go through cardiac rehab after having heart attacks and in major heart events. And so eventually uh, through medical school, got very interested in, in cardiology and specifically interventional cardiology, which is a fantastic field because you're able to actually treat the heart attack and you can see patients in real time be in you know, extreme distress from, from a very critical illness and, and be uh, almost instantaneously back to normal sometimes. So interventional cardiology is my passion. I've been an interventional cardiologist for about five or six years here in North Carolina and take care of a lot of STEMI patients, uh, which is an acute heart attack. And uh, I think that's what we're going to be talking about today, how to how to understand these patients better, how to how to um, triage them better and and kind of the background of that process. Yeah. So thank you so much for the introduction. And that's a fantastic segue. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the background and challenges of the current STEMI and hospital workflow? Yeah. The way I would think about it is, you know, um, before 2006, everyone was, you know, essentially trying to do their best, you know, uh, local EMS crews, local hospitals, you know, everyone had unique activation systems when someone was deemed to be having a heart attack. You know, sometimes it would be in a rural hospital, sometimes it would be in a paramedic at the field, and sometimes it would be in the local ER of the place where they do the intervention. Um, you know, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association saw all this wide variability of care and started to launch in about 2006 an initiative to try to standardize how people are treated and that's where the whole door to balloon time concept came up. You know, before that initiative officially launched, times were much longer. There wasn't an emphasis on transporting patients quickly. And so you ended up having patients who less than half the time were able to get under what is now the goal of 90 minutes from first medical contact to opening a blocked artery. And, you know, with that initiative from the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, it's it's actually way more common that you would meet that goal nowadays than not meet that goal. So they're able to take it from less than 50 percent to over 90 percent with uh, lots of education, lots of systems upgrade and slicking up the system. And so, you know, that's an interesting thing to think about from a couple of different ways. One. What if that patient lands in your emergency room and you're already there? Well, you know, kind of lucky for everybody in that situation, but it's a little bit tougher. And that's sort of what what we deal with sometimes when we have a patient in um, the mountains of Virginia or rural North Carolina, where they end up in a local hospital that does not have a, a cath lab where they can open up a blocked artery, and they're not so far away that they would get special clot busting medicine in their IV that would dissolve a clot systemically, and they're close enough to us that they should try to come to us to get that, that blockage opened. These are these patients who are, are out of hospital transfers. And typically, unlike when they show up in your emergency room and you have 90 minutes to try to open that artery, you're given 120 minutes when someone's being transferred from one facility to the next. And you know, there's a lot of barriers for that. Some of those you can change. You can't change the weather. You can't change the traffic. And sometimes things will, will come up. But there's lots of, you know, systems-based things that you can slick up to make things faster, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes plenty of sense. Are there any examples of system solutions uh, that you would use to slick it up? Yeah, you know, um, in many ways, things have gotten as fast as they maybe can in, in a lot of ways. You know, they look at things when patients hit the ER, how quickly they're able to get that first EKG. So that's 
an own individual metric within larger, broader metrics of this time. So you're trying to get that within, you know, five to 10 minutes. Then you're trying to time how quickly you're moving from the ER to the cath lab, which has its own set time. And then you're also looking at when the person enters the cath lab to how quickly you're able to get vascular access to open the blockage. And then then similarly, you know, between the access to opening the artery. So everything has been sort of chopped up um, to find areas of improvement. And all of this gets reported into national registries. And it's part of quality initiatives that interventional cardiologists meet many times a year to review. You know, the, the law of unintended consequences with this in some ways is that, you know, this has gotten very quick and very good. Um, but what ends up happening a lot of times is there's been such an emphasis on this that it's a very sensitive process when people are not in our hospital and out in the field or in, out in rural communities, but it's not as specific. So what ends up happening is uh, a lot of times there are what we call false activations. So basically not a STEMI, not an acute heart attack. Maybe it looks close to it or maybe it doesn't look like it at all, but whoever thought it was concerning said, this is a STEMI, we need to activate the cath lab. And so that is something that, you know, as part of the solution that I'm working with, with Viz, I'm trying to think about more and, and see if we can stay sensitive, capture all the real heart attacks, but maybe try to limit some of the ones that aren't real. Yeah. So could you tell us a little bit more about Viz AC solution and how it works in improving that workflow that you just outlined for us? Yeah, so the biggest thing for us is we got to get our eyes on the EKG and we need to avoid, you know, the burnout of our staff of having false activations. You know, depending on where you live, it can be as high as 10 to 30 percent of the ones that you're activated are actually not true, true STEMIs. And so that has issues with cost to the patient and to the healthcare system and and burnout with staff, but specific to to uh, the solution, you know, if someone's in our ER, we're able to pull up EKGs very quickly. But if someone has a separate medical record system in a rural area, um, then it could be very hard to visualize the EKG. So what we need to do as cardiologists, as well as uh, ER physicians is is get eyes on that EKG quickly to help either confirm a diagnosis or saying, you know, that that probably looks okay. And part of the issue is there's lots of different vendors. There's lots of different systems that are out there that you need to have to be able to log in to view these. I know some of the ways we do it is you've got to put your password in to go into your email to load the attachment. And it's hard to kind of figure out. And so um, another interesting thing, too, is that rural hospitals you know, sometimes you'll have people who don't have great cell phone signal and they want you to look at it, but they got to run out of the ER to try to find a few bars to text you a picture of the EKG. And that can slow down things significantly. So what what the Viz solution that we're piloting that's been working really well so far is a cloud based solution where you can have an EKG obtained in a rural hospital and before anyone looks at it, instantaneously, it gets uploaded to the cloud, which the referring uh, center with the interventional cardiologist is able to pull up basically instantaneously, no lag time, essentially from the obtaining of the EKG. STEMI is a clinical diagnosis, so I wish it were as easy as the EKG would just be the only way you had to tell, but there's lots of different patient-specific factors that help you determine if it's a true STEMI or not. So these patients still need to be evaluated and determined if they have a clinical STEMI. And if so, we're contacted. Literally by the time we're contacted, we're able to pull up on our phone through the Viz app and, and visualize the EKG. And that could be as simple as just a quick confirmation. Yep, totally agree. That's the real thing. Bring them on down. Or it could be the other side of things, which I think is really helpful is, hey, you know, I don't think that meets criteria. What's going on with this patient? Maybe we need to bed them up there for, you know, an hour or two and watch them and, and continue to evaluate. The beauty of that is if you're able to achieve that, then you can avoid a costly transfer that 
maybe never needed to happen to begin with. So it's really encouraging with the fact that the time frame matters so much in STEMI to hear the solution really does help shorten that and gets you the information as soon as you need it. It's also really encouraging to know that those false positives are being avoided and saving the healthcare system thousand dollars. Do you have any examples or patient cases that could help us understand how this ACS impacts the patient workflow? Better? Yeah, I could actually, I'll show you a few and try to send that request to you to share the screen, which I just sent. Um, while you're approving that request, what, what I'll say too is, you know, it's not that long ago where we would have EKGs faxed to us to be reviewed. And that obviously is a, a pretty slow process. So this is a, this is a normal EKG. Just for context, these EKGs look at electricity running through your heart from different angles. And that helps us decide where heart attacks occur and uh, what distribution, which artery of all the major arteries may be the one that's the culprit. So this is a classic normal looking one where you're not having lots of deviations from normal segments. This was one of our uh, true heart attacks that Viz caught for us at one of our rural hospitals. What you can see in these bottom leads, which is 2, 3, and ABF, typically this looks at the underside of the heart and the inferior wall. This could be a right coronary artery or a, a left coronary artery that has a blockage in it. You see elevation of the segment sphere, and then this ABL, you see some depression. So this was a great confirmation for us. We were on the phone. We said, yep, that's absolutely the real deal. Bring them down. And there was no guesswork as to, well, I hope they called it right there or not. It was very obvious, and we were prepared for that patient. You know, the other thing I would say that Viz is really excellent with is you're able to see in serial fashion EKGs for patients. If they were there two weeks ago, you can pull up their whole history. And so much of STEMI is a continuum. It may be partially blocked when patients originally come in, and then it can continue to worsen, and there can be a, a clinical um, worsening of their symptoms. And we see that in the EKG. For this example, this patient came into one of our local hospitals where Viz was connected, and at 815, their EKG looked pretty okay, so they did the appropriate thing and got them kind of hooked up, connected, and, and worked up, and then that patient had worsening pain later on at 11, and a second EKG was obtained, which shows more of a significant ischemic event with probably a posterior heart attack and when we were called about this, we were able to review the whole story instantly on our phones. And having really good flow on your app, having good taste, being able to see this and not have to log into five or six different things really matters for us. And so this was able to be viewed quickly and we got them down and into our cath lab. And the flip side is very true too. As important as it is to determine what's real, it's also really important to be able to look at something and say, you know, I don't think that quite meets criteria. Let's let's talk about this a little bit more. Maybe I can help you work this patient up. So this was a, a young, young patient who came in with some chest pain. We have lots of chest pain uh, ER visits. It's probably the most common type of ER visit that's out there. And there's lots of different things that causes chest pain. So this person was originally activated as an acute heart attack but upon review of the EKG and talking about it, it was determined that it's probably not. And once we had a better clinical story, that was, was more clear. And so again, this is what I'm really curious about as we have better access to being able to look at these EKGs to help make clinical decisions that might prevent transfers that might take up a bed when bed, bed uh, availability is scarce. And also good for the patient to not have to have that extra cost. Dr. Means, thank you so much for sharing those slides with us today. I, I could really see how with Viz AI solution, it was able to help prevent those futile transfers slash false STEMI activations and really helped with faster time to transfer. Uh, are there any closing comments like to share with us today before we go? You know, it, it's, a, it's a very common thing. Heart attacks and heart disease specifically is the number one reason patients and people in America pass away. So this is a, a common way that uh, we can make a really big impact on patients and, you know, being able to diagnose it, but also to say when it's not there, 
is both really important and um, looking forward to to trying to see if we can get this technology uh, more broadly accepted. We're looking forward to that. Dr. Means, thank you so much for your time today and thank you for watching everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.